we start with the smell of aviation fuel in the morning. Goats on every veranda. Vodka hijacking. Gunplay. Then finding out who's playing and calling the run of play. This guest is David Proven. Born and brought up in a very Rangers-supporting household. Tapped up by the Celtic assistant manager pretending to be a journalist, asking him whether he would, because of his background, be willing to do it properly for Celtic every week. Scotland player. When Aberdeen were dominant in Scotland as I was growing up, there were very few players from the old firm that I looked at covetously, and David Proven definitely was one. Davy Cooper, Bobby Russell, McCoist. But for sure... David Proven, an extremely gifted and hardworking winger who was very evidently a brilliant crosser of the ball and really intelligent on the football pitch. Liked him then, like him now, you'll know him as Sky's just about principal co-commentator. Certainly, in my view, the best, most acerbic, clever with his words co-commentator in uh, British televised football at the moment. I think it's really remarkable and a testimony to his ability and his quality that a man who never played um, for a big English club has been gradually promoted through the ranks at Sky and is now doing the very biggest games in what is a multi-billion pound industry. Kudos to David. I hope you enjoy our chat. Uh, I certainly like listening to him. I find him a very forthright, bright, likeable man. A man who I've seen handling himself pretty well in a Barcelona karaoke bar. Again, kudos to David for that one. We finish talking about Willie Henderson and Jimmy Johnson. Throughout it, there are anecdotes about Walter Smith, Tommy Burns, Big Sam. But at the end, his memories of playing against Vincente Del Bosque in Real Madrid captivate me, as they've always done, as he always does whenever he speaks. Ladies and gentlemen, recorded in the Hotel Duvan in Glasgow's leafy West End, Lovely, elegant place, Hotel Devan. You maybe once knew it as One Devonshire Gardens. If you're going to Glasgow, stay there. Davy, thanks for all the memories. And thanks for being, I think, the single best co-commentator who's able to explain his art in this podcast. And um, a good football man. Listen on, people. Listen on. Anybody who's ever listened to the, the 1.6 million of you who have listened to the big interview know that the reason for David Proven being with us today is, apart from his talent and apart from your talent and ability and achievements, it's because the guys at the podcast and I really admire and like you. Um, so if it's okay, because I hope this will be a wide-ranging chat, we'll start with shared experiences because <laughs> we are co-authors in a book called Henrik Hairdryers and I don't know what else. And yeah. you relate the tale of flying with Celtic, but not as a player, to Georgia in about 95. So we're, we're coming up to, yeah, we're, we're past the 20 year anniversary of so a trip that I was on too, and Celtic were going to play Dynamo Batumi. And you tell the story beautifully. And you made me glad that I didn't imagine it all because it's one of the most bizarre experiences yeah, in my entire life. And given that you were a player who with Scotland and, and Celtic went round the world, does Batumi against Celtic rank as one of the weirdest experiences of your well, life it, too. It's got to be, and I wasn't long in the the media business. And we flew, I think, uh, I think I'm think i right in, in saying we flew from Glasgow to Istanbul. Istanbul, that's right. Yeah. And then we had to use the national carrier to get into Georgia. Or so Fergus McCann told us <laughs> we had to use the national carrier. And the first alarm bell that went is, is when we got on this aircraft, which I think was a Yak-49. And the carpets on the aircraft were threadbare. Some of the seat belts were missing. There was a distinct smell of aviation fuel <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the cabin. And eventually this thing somehow managed to cough and splutter up into the air, at which point the veterans of the Scottish media demanded the drinks trolley. Out came the, the drinks trolley and drinks were taken. And if I remember correctly, there was quite a bit of turbulence oh, awesome. and a lot of concern that this, this aircraft might actually stay in the, in the air. And eventually the captain appeared with the, the gold braid, the, the captain's peaked cap on and the gold braid and the epaulets and come walking down the aisle, trying to reassure people. And my dear friend, no longer with us, Ian Archer, yeah. one of the great Scottish sports writers, asked the captain if he could have a moment and the captain came over to us. 
And Ian said, uh, dear boy, as was his opening gambit on those occasions, he said, uh, this aircraft, he said, is this X Aeroflot fleet? And the captain said, uh, ah, yes, X, X Aeroflot uh, fleet, very good aircraft. And Ian said, uh, how old would it be? 25, 30 years, very good aircraft. <laughs> Ian said, and what about the engines? Pratt and Whitney? <laughs> to which Sergey replied, <clears throat> Not Pratt and Whitney, but very good copy. <laughs> so, so at that point, the large ones were ordered all round again. I'm very glad that was up the back of the plane, not yeah. hearing all this, because you described it, you called it a yak, but I mean, I think the engines were yak power, and we got yak sandwiches, and it was the seat belts either came away in your hand, yeah. the chairs were all rocking and shaky, and the it was, was curling up. And I think being optimists, you think, well, that's the worst part over. <laughs> and, and we've heard in advance, my memory is that somebody told me, Batumi's really beautiful. Geographically, it stays with me. It, it's a little bit like Monaco in that it's a, a big curved horseshoe, isn't it? And it? You're dead right. It sort of tumbles down to the sea, the, the Black Sea. We flew over it last year, and we were out with uh, Scotland and Georgia and flew over it. It's now a very upmarket. Uh, really? resort but um, but when, when we were arriving there a bit context for those who are listening who have not heard any of this before just before we arrived they tried to blow up Edward Shevardnadze that's I think right he was, he was the president, yeah. president we'd been warned that there was a cholera epidemic <laughs> <laughs> and even they were kind of the least of our problems because it was sort of a grubby lawless strange what yeah. were the strangest or the most unpleasant things that happened to you while you were there because I had a few. It was, um, we stayed in Hotel Sputnik, if I remember correctly. And I, I remember, think you do. I remember the day before the game, we went a walk around the hotel, and I've never seen such a poor, impoverished place in my entire yeah. life. I remember seeing a high a block of high flats where there was a goat on every veranda. That's where the locals got their milk. It did kind of startle us as we... As oh, we yeah, it was, it was a pretty, pretty humbling uh, yeah. sight, the whole place. Yeah. There were buses abandoned by the side of the street because they had no diesel. Yeah. The thing that genuinely sticks out to me is... There were giant, great big oxen just ambling in, yeah. the, in the oncoming lane. Yeah. It was a bizarre thing. We eventually re retired to the hotel swimming pool with a kind of patio area outside the hotel. It was very warm. It was a beautiful uh, climate. So we, we gathered around the swimming pool. There was no water in the swimming pool for some reason, but we gathered there anyway. And a few drinks were poured. And the next minute, this huge Mercedes, this vehicle, it was like something out of the Godfather, uh, all of a sudden arrived. And the guys in the black Versace suits got out with the shades on. And they sat opposite us. And a couple of minutes later, a bottle of the local vodka was sent to our table. On the label was uh, Shevardnadze, who was the president. Shevardnadze's vodka. President's vodka. So they invited us to toast the president uh, and toast Batumi, which we did. We then sent a bottle of scotch over to them. And within an hour, they had joined us. They, they were the local... Mafiosa, probably. They controlled Batumi or had a very good handle on what was happening. It got a bit raucous through, through alcohol. And one of, the, one of the Celtic fans, there were a couple of Celtic fans who joined us, got a little bit out of order and a little bit of aggressive mm -hmm. and started pointing the finger into the chest of one of our guests, at which point mm. he stood up and pulled a revolver out of his pocket <laughs> and pointed it at this little guy's temple and said, sit down, please. Please sit down. <laughs> At which point, Hi. No all bears were off. Aye. No, I didn't know it had gone Tarantino, but I do remember the, the players talking about bug-infested beds. Um, yeah. I remember that there was, quite nearby, there was shelling going on amongst other... Armeni the Armenians and the Azerbaijanis were at war at that time. And, and you could tell, couldn't you? Yeah. It was bizarre. It was... And, and Celtic go and win the game, and, and what, what will stick with me is, again, you learn when not to breathe out and say, oh, well, well, that was a bit of an experience, wasn't it? Because, again, confirm my memory because it's a bit of a haze. We, we, I remember we get to the, to the plane, we go on the plane, we sit there for a chunk of time until it emerges that we're, we're not being allowed to leave. Well, I, I remember the game itself because my microphone packed in after 10 minutes. Oh, sorry, Dougie McDonald's, who was commentating for Radio Clyde, yeah. I was co-com. Dougie's microphone packed in after 10 minutes, at which point he has to take my microphone and I'm out of the game, so I've travelled all this way to do 10 minutes' work, at which point I became a spectator. But after the game, you're right, we got back to the airport and they wouldn't let us leave. They said we hadn't paid our telephone bills at the stadium, which 
basically was a, it's a bit of blackmail, wasn't it, yeah. to, to get more money off us? I think they asked for, was it 100 American dollars ahead? I, th I think it was a chunk to get of money. Out. And if my memory serves me correctly, there were no runway lights. Yeah. It, was a, it was a disused military yeah, yeah. airport, Absolutely. and we had to be out before dusk. Otherwise not go. That was the thing. And uh, there was a chunk of them around us. They were weapon carrying at the nose of the plane underneath, shouting up and negotiating up, which I presume was with, certainly with Fergus, who maybe had the money under his bonnet or whatever, but wasn't <laughs> happy about what was going yeah, abs on. Absolutely. And, and the worry was that we had to try and get out. Because when we arrived, I don't know if you remember, when we arrived in daylight, uh, when we arrived in Batumi, in broad daylight, there were cows wandering about the airfield. <laughs> Now, clearly, the, the pilot landing had a visual and, and could see if there was a, a cow on the, on the, the runway. <laughs> but going out, by the time this thing revved up to get off the ground again, yeah. it was pitch black. Heaven knows. And I remember careening down that runway thinking, I hope there's not a cow at the end of this runway that Have we're going to hit. Have luminous you. paint in Batumi just wow, to goodness. identify where the cows are. And as, as we took off, and uh, in the climb, that's, you could see the, the flash fire in the mountains. That's what I remember. You can see the... the fire lighting up the mountains as, as they shoot. And you can see them going either way. Yeah. And you're like, well, it was, uh, pilot, let's, let's stay left. Never <laughs> been so glad to, to see Istanbul in all my life as, as I was after But it, it, after it's like, I, mean, I think we can be reasonably unapologetic for the fact that these experiences become characterful. I think it's part of the reason, if you're not playing or managing, that when you go around the world, these are good tales to take back. I think they're life enhancing, as long, yeah. as, you, as, long as you come away with your life. But they'll contrast absolutely with the experiences that you've got now and the reason, the main reason that we were very, very keen to talk to you because not only have you done, I think, 21 years solidly with Sky? Uh, 95, yeah, so that would be, yeah. So your 21st year is beginning and, and you know, you're, I think, an elite columnist who says accurate things fearlessly and with good expressions and you began at Radio Clyde, but... What fascinates me is that I remember when I was friendly with Gianluca Vialli and when he was sacked, we spent time, he gave me an interview in his house and he said, well, what I'm going to go and do now is I'm going to go back to Italy. He said, I want to give to Italy what Sky has done for the British game. Because he said, well, I've been here, I've seen the way that Sky is opening up football and how they describe it, how they break it down, yeah. the analysis. And it's changing how people consume it and it's making people more educated. He said, my country's impoverished like that. We're better at football. We're more scientific about football, but our, <laughs> our criticism is all like, the defending was rubbish, the referee's crook. And he said, I'm going to go back and do there what this guy. And I think that you're part of exactly how that's kicked on hugely since then. In my view, it's an honest view. In that, particularly when you're co-commentating, it's a difficult art. Well, how did you approach the art of co-commentary at a big Premier League in terms of what your objective was? I think I was fortunate in that I had done commentary on radio for a number of years with Radio Clyde, and it's a completely different discipline, completely different. But it, but it was certainly uh, helpful that I had been a co-com on radio. And then I, I got a break. John Robertson, the former Hearts player, was doing co-commentary on live Scottish football, and, and John, for some reason, couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And Andy Melvin, who was um, number two to Vic Wickling at Sky, phoned me and said, Kilmarnock, I think it was Kilmarnock Celtic, he said, do you want to go at co commentary? And I said, yeah, sure. And that was the start. I, I remember doing it that night and kept the, the, the gig for Scottish football and had been doing it for a number of years. And ironically enough, got the call from Scott Melvin, who now produces the live uh, football for Sky, asking me if I wanted to, to do... My very first game was, was Queen's Park Rangers Newcastle. I got a call on a Sunday night from Scott. That somebody must have called off and I went down on the Monday and did that. And that would be, that'd be four years ago that I've been doing the English Premier League live football, mm -hmm. which obviously was a big step up in terms of the demands and the audience and the pressure, if, if you like. It's a bit like playing. Mm -hmm. I think you have good games and bad games. I'm probably my own worst critic. I'm very, really happy with, with what I do during a game. You, you know when you've had a, a decent game and you know when you've had a poor game. If you've had a wrong call, if you've called something wrongly, yeah, I suppose you beat yourself up about it. And I think most of the co-commentators are the same. There are times where you've got to stick your neck out. And if a replay comes in that shows you you've been wrong, it leaves a pretty sour taste in your mouth. You know? that, that's understood. And this is where I want to intervene. Because I'll stick my neck out without naming names across the media. I'm not talking about this guy. There are ex-professional footballers or ex-managers who don't add what you add. And in my view, 
that will very often be that when there's an action and it's been called by the commentator, and we've all seen it, yeah. I think it's one of the separations yeah. you made about radio and television in that you've got to add something extra. What I hear often are things that will make me clearer about why something happened, what should have happened instead. Mm. And I also find that quite often you'll link from a previous incident in the game, a game two weeks ago, so that there is, in, in a sparse amount of words, when the commentator hands to you, or whatever, yeah. however you do it, which is something I'd like to know about. How to yeah. So you're doing that. Tell me about that process, about adding extra. Is it that you're not afraid to comment, to, to open things up? Is it that you've got a very good analytical football brain? Because that's what it comes across. I think you're just trying to be um, slightly ahead of the game, if you like. You know, there are things that obviously will help you if a corner's been taken. You will observe whether the, the team's defending zonally, who's picking up who, is the goalkeeper being blocked off, the referee's position. Before the kick is taken, you're, you're trying to take a mental note of these things. Because very often the ball will come into the box. Five huge guys will go up and the ball ends up in the net. You're not sure what's happened. And then I, I suppose the only thing you can add was that they were picking up man for man. So somebody's not done their job or yeah. whatever. There are some horrible goals where you can't really add anything to it. I think there are times where you can add, where if you've... And again, if the ball's out wide, I, I think you're normally... I'm normally looking in the box to see who's picking up who. Are the full-backs ahead of the two centre-backs in case the ball's knocked in behind and, the, and there's an offside? Who's deepest for the defence and whatnot? Little things like that give you a help, if you like, you know? So is there any correlation in that process as to how you played, because you know you were a footballer that I think was also ahead of the game and, and working long before the ball came to you. Is, I think just that... anticipation, Graham. You know, you, you try to anticipate what might happen next. The two cameras that most co-commentators could live on are the two 18-yard cameras. Mm -hmm. Now, the director doesn't want to use them all the time, obviously, because it would become pretty boring for the viewer. But they are the cameras that the, the co-commentators would probably get most mileage from because you can see the last defender for offsides. You have a pretty good view of the, of the pitch. And you can tell the story most of the time from the 18-yard cameras. And we're, we're lucky at Sky that the, the directors will, nine times out of ten, give you the picture that best allows us to tell the story. What you've got to be ready to do is tell the story on the first replay. Yeah. I think a lot of people think if you're co-commentating, you get the benefit of the replay. You've got to call it on the replay, so you, you've really got to have... You're not seeing it and calling well, you, it. You've got to have tried to have figured it out before the replay comes in so mm. you, you can add something. Now, this but, is interesting for the, for the listener here, I think. Let's, let's not take yesterday's game. Let's say a very, very high-pressure game. You're at Arsenal hosting Manchester City. You're co-commentating with, say, Martin Tyler, whoever it might be, Ian, doesn't matter. And um, there is something pretty significant happens. Let's say it's in the 18-yard box to your left. David Silva's had a rebounded shot, which um, Chips touched over the bar. And Do they tell you, David, we're coming to this now? What's in your ear? Are you, do you have an unfettered view and you just have to guess what's coming? What's the process that I, happens? I think you, 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 know, you know through experience of working for Sky what angle you're going to get. I mean, I, I can go on to the director and ask him for an angle. Mm -hmm. I can say, give me the high behind or give me the 18 yard. The directors are, are slick enough that you can anticipate what angle you're going to get. You'll, get. you'll get the angle that best allows you to describe what's just happened. The directors at Sky are, are pretty hot in terms of giving the co-commentator the right angle. So that's, that tells... Again, our listeners, something that the directors at Sky need to have, as well as a very good television brain, they need to have a good football brain. They need to understand you and the commentators Most too. of them are, are football fans who, who have got a, a pretty good understanding of the game. Most of them are football fanatics. Mm. But practically everyone who works for Sky, you, yeah. you'll have come across them. Yeah. They're all football nuts. I've come across very few people who, who aren't really right into the football. So when this process is happening, is your head ever crowded with noise? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the biggest um, obstacles for commentators, I think, is PA systems. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I remember doing a, an Everton Manchester United game with Alan Parry. It would be the first game of the season, two seasons ago. It was a game that Marwan Fellaini outjumped Michael Carrick for Everton's goal. Everton won 1-0. And before the game, and there's a huge speaker at Goodison Park that faces the television gantry. And Alan Parry and I, the studio had handed over to us. Alan was trying to do the teams. Team graphic comes in, Alan's doing the teams. I then come in after the substitutes. 
because we then highlight a couple of players. And this PA system was just so loud. You couldn't hear the, the director. Uh, you were just going on pictures. You, you had no cue. And we were just going into pictures we could see. You could not hear yourself think. And that, that's, that's when it becomes, it can get a bit tricky if you like. And when you talk about a gantry, what, what again, not everybody will know is that you can often be right in the midst of quite a noisy stand. Traditionally, you'll probably be in the main stand, so it's not like being behind a goal. A television gantry is, if I'm not wrong, has is, is got a, an eagle eye view. It's quite high up yeah, yeah. in the roof of a stand sometimes. But you will be surrounded by people celebrating a goal or shouting at the referee. And again, what comes across, and I'm trying to gauge whether it's a deliberate thing or it's just natural from you, is that your delivery is very measured, which I think is a benefit in that commentators maybe need to inflect their voice and rise and yeah. show their excitement. But what comes across, again, without gushing too much, is that you come in with quite a... It's a Sean Connery, James Bond. It's like... <laughs> but you, well. you pick things off without getting hugely excited. And Gary Neville used a phrase here is that he avoids hyperbole because if you say that this guy's a genius, then yeah. what about the guy who outplays him 10 minutes later or right. this is the best game ever? How do you plan for your words? What do you do? Certainly when, when I began, I, I found myself just through excitement and you were talking about the atmosphere in the stadium. Mm. And I think the atmosphere in the stadium can affect you as a, a commentator. Mm -hmm. I, I genuinely believe that. Sure. If, you know, if the ground is sure. noisy, yeah. and there are grounds that are very, very noisy. And I think it, it becomes a discipline that only comes with time where you can try and detach yourself a little bit and just remember to try and keep a, an even pace about what you're saying. I mean, I, I think initially, when I started working in the, the English Premier League, I was speaking far too quickly and I had to consciously try to slow yeah. down. If I was sitting here with my pals having a West of Scotland discussion, very few people in England would understand what we're saying. We do speed up a little bit. We, we do. When we're excited. So, so there had to be a conscious effort in terms of, of trying to slow down so that the rest of Britain, if you like, not just the West of Scotland, can understand what, what I'm saying. <laughs> well, the delivery comes across, I think, clinically, and I think it adds... Just like there's a, a myth in England, people say that some Scots get ahead because we can sound aggressive or menacing or convincing or whatever yeah. it is. There's something about our accent that seems to work. <laughs> but I also, it's my feeling that there's an authority in what you say that goes beyond simply calling things well or being ahead of the game or making a viewer say, well, I didn't notice that. I wondered if that was deliberate or if that was natural. Because you do speak with authority. I think that's something whereby my feeling is that apart from earning a wage, when you're on it, and my feeling is you want to excel. We all want to excel. I mean, I, I think the authority thing maybe is a bit of luck that that's just my... Seriously? Yeah, I, I really do. I think that's just my delivery. I think you should always try to, to be emphatic. I work with broadcasters like, you know, Jerry McNee, Archie McPherson, people like that. And I think it's important that you, you sound as if you believe in what you're saying. I think if there's, if there's doubt in your voice, I'm not sure the viewer wants to hear doubt. He's looking to the commentators for, for an assured view. He's not looking for doubt. No, but again, we're not in this podcast to call individual people out, but there are ex-pros who I hear telling me what I've just seen over and over again. Yeah. And they make a living out of it. That's the obvious one. When I, Andy Melvin uh, hired me, he said, tell me something I haven't noticed. He said, the commentator is there to tell the viewer what has happened. You're there to tell the viewer why it happened. And that, I think that's the best distinction between a commentator and a co-commentator. And there are times, as I said, Graham, where the ball comes into the box, it's in the net, you don't have a clue who scored, it's a horrible, messy goal, and they are a nightmare for commentators mm -hmm. who have to identify the, the scorer as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. As a co-com, sometimes you do end up saying the, the bleeding obvious, if you like, describing the bleeding obvious. Mm. But other times, you've, you've had a good steer, you've maybe looked up the pitches, who's picking up who, and something will happen and you've got a good idea of why it happened. And they're the, if you get it right, it's, it's very satisfying if you, if you get it right. What opportunities to add to your research do you get from maybe people you know in the game or when you're at a ground? Like, for example, it'd be quite interesting for me, for those who listen, to just understand the, the routine of a match day. How you get to the ground, what happens. The commentators, obviously, when I went to England, had, had no contacts in England. I had one or two, because there, there were Scots down there, like Davy Moyes, mm -hmm. one, one or two different Scottish managers. And I could phone David and go into his room at Goodison before a game if, if I went in early enough. He would mark my card in terms of how Everton were going to play. He was good enough to give me an insight into how he thought the opposition would play, which is a great steer. 
you know, you're getting inside the manager's head, you know what he's looking for. So to be able to impart that knowledge during the broadcast, I think it's priceless. Yeah, agreed. You know, to, to tell the viewer what David Moyes is trying to achieve today. Yeah. Um, and he's also given you a good steer on how the opposition are going to play. But by and large, the commentators in England, Martin Tyler, Alan Parry, Rob Hawthorne, Ian Crocker and all the guys, they have very long-established contacts with managers. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, they will get the team well before kickoff, mm -hmm. And that is a great advantage mm -hmm. if you have the team in the shape. A, we can get the graphics right at Sky. Yep. And B, as a co-commentator, it, it gives you a good idea of what they're trying to do once you see the shape. You begin to think through where there might be individual battles, yeah, where the formations ab absolutely. give an advantage. Absolutely. Are they playing three central midfield players? Are they, are they trying to choke the midfield or are they going to be more expansive? There are occasions, there was an occasion a couple of weeks ago, um, and I hope I'm not telling tales out of school, but <laughs> Alan Parry phoned Sam Allardyce and, and Sam is one of the more helpful managers in the business and he gave Alan the shape. It sounded like a very unlikely shape because of the players in the team. Mm -hmm. Gary Nev and, and Jamie Carragher were very doubtful that this might be the, the shape of the team. AP went back on to Sam and said, look, are you sure that's the way you're going to play tonight? And Sam had, had said it was, it was going to be a back four with John O'Shea playing left back and that's, that's why we were doubtful. Yeah, yeah. And Sam said, no, no, it's, it's definitely a back four, O'Shea left back, so we've put the graphic up in Monday Night Football uh, and teams come out and you know within five seconds when the game kicks off, it's a back three. So whether, whether Sam had a last moment change of mind, he may have changed his mind when he got the, the Crystal Palace team sheet. He may have changed it. Uh, and to be fair to Sam, he apologised to, to Alan Parry after the game. Sam knows how the, the business has worked. He's done co-commentary yeah. uh, himself at times. He was good enough to apologise to Alan Parry after the game, but that's one of but these occasions. I also think we both know that the desire from any leading team, any leading coach, by which I don't necessarily mean Barcelona or Madrid, but I mean anybody who aspires to be the best, they also aspire to know what the other team's going to shape like. Yeah. Who's in, who's out, is somebody playing out of position. And therefore changes at, at, at the last minute, that uh, maybe Sam made, they're, they're commonplace if you get the information in advance. It's, yeah. it's a pretty natural thing to do, I, I think. Yeah. And, and you can get an advantage, can't you? In, in, lo, in that hour and a half before kickoff, I genuinely believe if you find somebody's out or if you find that they've changed shape and you haven't anticipated, there's a chance that the opposition have only trained twice yeah. on it. And it must affect your mentality. Well, you're ahead of the game. If, 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 you, if you know the team, you, you've got half a chance because once you have the 11 players who are playing, you should be able to determine what, shape, what the shape is going to be. By and large, you know how they're going to play by the 11 players. Uh, and if, if you're ahead of the game, if you've got the team before the game, you're, you're ahead of the game, if you like. And one, you know, one, of the, one of the biggest compliments I had when I was doing the Scottish live football was that at a time when Walter Smith and Tommy Burns were managing on opposite sides of the, the town, I could phone Walter Smith and Walter would give me his team knowing I was a very good friend of Tommy's. Yeah. Now that for me is... It's trust and respect. It's, it's a matter of trust, yeah. yeah. And that, that was a huge compliment. I would probably find it harder at that time to get Tommy's team than, than Walter's team, <laughs> bizarrely enough. I thought you were going to make me ask that question, and I was going to, so I'm really glad. Yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, because I was not his ex-teammate. I was not a close friend, but I took him. He asked me to help him. We went to Juventus together for a study trip, which I set up. Right. I got to know him. I liked him and admired him. And I know yeah. Walter did. Yeah. Walter, even though he broke Tommy's heart over and over again, yeah. Walter adored him too. But Tommy was much a jumpier man than, than yeah. Walter and was less sure about his 11. And he made me smile because those were, those were strong memories of before I left Glasgow. And I would have thought Tommy might have been more, might not have even known his team. Oh, I know, I know. And, and now, now and again, you know, I would go to, to Tommy and, and say, you know, can you, can you give me a steer? Can you give me a team? And he would say, uh, have you got, the, you got the Rangers team? And I would say, yeah, I have. <laughs> He would say, well, can you give me a steer? And I would say, Tommy, I love you, I love you, you to bits. I love you to bits, but it's more than my life is exactly worth. Exactly so. And that, that trust in now, now and again has broken down. If a manager feels his team has been leaked, yeah. he, he'll never... Well, the, the one I know who's manic about it, the two, Mourinho is manic about that, absolutely manic yeah. about that. And he's doing himself damage now because there are players in his last two clubs who have... Shared more than you would if you were absolutely loyal to your manager. If you, if you had that bond with your manager as a group where you were like, well, what we've got is sacrosanct. 
but he's beginning to talk about rats and he's talking yeah. about chivatos, people stabbing me in the back. And yeah. I think if you start in that dynamic, it's terrible. The other one who's obsessed by it, but doesn't get as accusatory is Pep Guardiola. Right. He fully believes that whatever and he's would, doing... Would any, would any of the Spanish commentators get uh, Guardiola's team not before again? Chance. Not a yeah. chance. Never in a million years. Yeah. And for two reasons. One, he's not that close to anybody. But also, w without me speaking for him, really only what maybe he's shared and, and taught me, so I'm not speaking for him, just relating what he said, that he is so detailed in his preparation. He's, he believes so much in getting a competitive advantage for his team, whichever his 11 is, whichever club it is, from his own planning of what he wants to do to the opposition, yeah. that even giving any of that away right. strips something back in his view. I can understand that. I've got to say, if, if, if I was going into the game tomorrow, into football management, yeah. and that's obviously not going to happen now, but if, if it were to happen, I would probably only give my team to people I trusted with my life. Yeah. And that kind of trust, I think, can only be developed over a long number of years. And, you know, I mentioned Sam Allardyce wrong-footing us at uh, Crystal Palace. Yeah. Sam Allardyce is, is one of the most helpful managers in the business. Yeah. If he trusts a commentator, we'll help him. Yeah. But that, that trust game has to be established over a long period of time. You've touched on something as well, because if you, if you think about that group, you know, hypothetically, you're a manager now. Certainly what Pep Guardiola is very sparing about is when he tells his own players. I'm not sure if that's a, a lack of trust. I think it's maybe a cynicism about people talk. Almost everything leaks. Watergate leaked. <laughs> um, I think if you're a manager who, who doesn't want to tell the players until an hour before kickoff who's playing... You have to have a very good philosophy of why that is. You have to start from the beginning telling them it'll always be this way. Yeah. Because otherwise you don't feel trusted. But players do yeah. lead teams. I'll tell you a story about you know, the element of trust. The Celtic were playing at Kilmarnock many years ago and Ian Crocker and I were doing the game. And I got the, I got the Celtic team on the afternoon of the game. So I've given it to Ian Crocker, who I trust implicitly. Yeah. So we know how Celtic are going to line up. And it was quite an unusual lineup because they had several injuries. And one or two names that nobody would have expected have come into the team. So Crocs and I have got the Celtic team. We've got the shape and we're at Rugby Park. And Celtic arrived. It was at the time of John Barnes and Kenny Dalglish. Mm -hmm. And David Tanner had just started as a reporter for Sky. Mm -hmm. So David said to me, have you any idea? And I said, yeah, I've got the Celtic team. And the formation, just for your use only, obviously. Um, At which point, just as a parenthesis, any touchline reporter is doing cartwheels because that's yeah. the world off his shoulders. Well, it, it helps his interview, doesn't oh. it, with the manager and, and whatnot. So David um, has a team in the formation and being at that time wet behind the ears, walks out onto the centre circle where John Barnes is and <laughs> shows him the team <laughs> and says, John, can you confirm that's how you're oh, lining Lord, up you David, <laughs> David, if you're listening, <laughs> come on, son. So, <laughs> Celtic draw the game, and after the game, um, Kenny and John Barnes won't let them go into the showers after the game until, until they find out. Somebody puts their hand up in terms of who, who leaked the team to Sky. Mm. And the next morning, and I knew it was going to happen, the, the phone rang, and it was Tommy Boyd tearing my head off, which I had to take on the chin. But mm. it was a salutary lesson. Well, can I, can I, the world is based on equilibrium. So can I say that Tommy is one of the reasons that I believe that I might enjoy this profession because when I was working for the mighty Green Final in Aberdeen, one of my first jobs, probably in the 80s, the man who, who encouraged me to try and talk about football at hospital radio, so your co comms on Clyde, ring a small bell for my tiny little jumble sale work in the 80s on hospital radio, commentating on matches. Damien Quigley said to me, oh, there'll be work for you. And the Green Final in Aberdeen run a weekly column on the old firm. Phone up Tom Boyd, he'll speak to you. That's like, you know, <laughs> is LSD still freely available in Green? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, Tom. Um, it's, it's somebody you've never heard of working for the Green final. <laughs> no problem at all, said Tommy. Of course I'll chat about the game. Yeah. No worries at all. And I have to, it would be outright wrong of me not to recall that this guy who played at Chelsea, who captain Scotland, yeah. who was a super captain, nice man, said to me, oh, I'll talk to you. Nah, I thought in those days, that, that 80s, 
I thought that was special. So Tommy, a little hello from both David and I. <laughs> um, so we've got to we've got to jalousing the teams, the Machiavellian art of getting the team on match day, and you're in the club, and you talked about when you first went down that match day was without a lot of contacts because your life had been spent mostly in Scotland. Yeah, that's probably changed. You're now face to sky. You're important people. Sky fund a lot of the Premier League and, and presumably now from that point onwards as you've arrived and you maybe have I haven't got the teams you're, you're beginning to prepare you're an hour two three away from kickoff. what's the schedule what's the countdown what's the minutiae of that the, the great thing is that I will know what games I'm doing a month in advance so given the, the wonder of Sky Plus now and Saturday Night Football and Sky Match Choice Football yeah. where you you can tape any game you want yeah. I will Whatever game I'm doing next Saturday, I will be taping this Saturday. Mm -hmm. So once you've seen the, the teams, obviously you do a bit of research in terms of injuries and how it might change, suspensions. But I will always have seen the teams that I'm about to, to do. Always will have watched their previous game and had a good look at them. Mm -hmm. I'll know who's injured, who's suspended, who's likely to come in. Mm -hmm. And if you can get a, an, an early steer on the team, mm -hmm. and most of the Sky commentators are well enough in with the managers mm -hmm. that they will get the teams early, then you're, you couldn't be better prepared by the time the, the game kicks so off. So what do you do? Sit down and think or chat or from the moment that you've got the teams to, to when you're sitting, for example, when do you need to be sat in the gantry? What's the you know, the countdown to kick off? I, I usually go up early and, and just watch the warm-ups because um, yeah. you know, sometimes players get injured in the warm-up yeah. and that in itself is a, is a story. I'm usually in the gantry a minimum, usually at the ground, I try and be there three hours before kickoff because there is work to do for Sky Sports News. Yes. There's always a, a cross. Which the, means you on the pitch yeah. with a microphone yeah. and the Sky Sports News studio will hand to you and say, well, did yeah. he... Hand to a reporter and we do a couple of minutes on the game. To preview it. Yeah. Usually on the gantry an hour before kickoff, watch the warm-ups. Do uh, you detect mood? Do you think sometimes it, if you've done a team several times over a couple of seasons and you watch the warm-up, can you detect... Mood and touch and who's looking I, I think you know the mood in terms of the, the last few results. You know what kind of shape they're in mentally, you know, depending on the last few results. I think what fans mean is that if they're at a game early, they will watch the warm-up. Yeah. They're chatting, they're not chatting, he, yeah. he's not hitting the target. Does any of that matter much from your own experience? Not really sure. I mean, uh, I'm not sure you can take much from the body language in the warm-up. No. Okay. I think perhaps recently, unless there is a, a clearly unhappy dressing room, and Chelsea, I think, is a very good example of that mm -hmm. in, in recent times where I would argue that the body language of the players was pretty obvious that they, they weren't happy at their work. And I think we saw the, the contrast at, at Crystal Palace yesterday where a Chelsea team seemed to have the weight of the world off their shoulders and were expressive again and looked like Chelsea. Crisp or intense, they were yeah, at it. They, yeah. they loved their work again. Whereas previously, didn't didn't look, look right. it didn't look right. No. So then, off we go, and the match begins. Are you... Finding your rhythm and... Does it matter who's beside you? Because each commentator is different. And there's no point in hiding the fact that, you know, I would say the same to you and I did to Gary, but Martin Tyler, who I know and has told me great anecdotes and, and was at the, the football tournament that erupted everything for me in 1982 in the World Cup. And yeah. told me enormous stories about working for ITV then, what that was like with Big Jack Charlton. But he's a superb of commentator. Yeah. And you've now begun to work with him as much as with Ian and with Alan Parry as well. How do you tailor what you do compared to who's next to you? I think you, you tailor it according to their style, if you like, their tempo. And they, they have different ways of doing it. I mean, Ian Crocker and I worked in Scottish football for years. You, it's almost like a husband and wife. I knew when he was going to stop talking. Ah, okay. I knew instinctively. And he would know instinctively when I was going to stop talking. Mm -hmm. I mean, the golden rule is a cocom. You know, when the ball's gone into the box, the cocom has to shut up. You don't talk over a, a possible goal. Yeah. Um, you, you've got to make sure the commentator's in charge if there's a chance of a goal. But basically, they all do it differently. They all do it clearly. They all do it very well, or they wouldn't be there. But they're all they're all different, and I think they're you not become... tap on the shoulder when one of them wants you to come in, or no. are you looking? At, are you talking? Sometimes to... there's a bit of eye contact. Nah. Sometimes there's a bit of eye contact. But I, I just think you, you come to know when they're finished. If you like, you know, when a goal is scored, some commentators will wrap up pretty quickly and let you in, some commentators are more expansive, and you just get to know through working with them when you come in. It's useful if it can become natural that when the goal scored or an incident takes place, the commentator doesn't go so far that he's actually taking away what you're preparing to say, because yeah. then you're left 
kind of high and dry. I think most of the commentators they are, know. They're savvy enough to know. And generous enough. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, now and again, you'll crash each other. And that, I think, tends to happen when you haven't worked with a commentator. You find you're, you're crashing each other. But over a period of time, it, it becomes like a, a relationship, you know? It feels uh, like a reasonable privilege to be working in that league for that company, earning a reasonable living, I presume, watching at elite grounds, huge turnouts, massive crowds, yeah. being at the heart of very big stories yeah. and, and following a narrative. If you got a big thrill out of it, does it give you the adrenaline? Do you have butterflies? Do you get adrenaline? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the bigger the game, the, the more... The tighter you'll be before a game. Um, I mean, the Arsenal Man City a couple of weeks ago is, is probably as big as it gets mm -hmm. at this stage of the season. You know, you, you don't want to be making a mistake in that. Put it that way. If you're hoping that you call everything right, that, yeah. that you don't make an obvious mistake, you, you're hoping that you're calling it properly, calling it quickly, adding um, to it. Add, adding to it. Well, who stands out for you? What do you see? that you don't get to, you know, call in the matches. For example, we went to spend a fantastic morning doing this with Chris Wardle, and he immediately said to us when he began to talk about the Premier League, because it wouldn't be fair to you because Sky are such big backers of the Premier League that I, I have got doubts about some of the technical qualities that I think have dipped. In the time I've been away, I draw a comparison between the Schmeichel, Bergkamp, the Canio, Zola era that, that I left behind to maybe how much technical ability we see now and Chris was of that opinion too he the technique be, has dropped in the, I think so. the Premier League I think there are fewer players of absolute excellence like that you could name some of them but are there as many and, and I think the players who are very quick and run and are tall but are there enough who always know what to do with a ball without having done anything sparkling whose touch is two footed who are aware of what to do with the ball and are mm -hmm. tactically intelligent so the manager can devolve intelligence to the pitch is there as much of that? No, I, I wouldn't say there is. But Chris was also of that view. He was worried about, particularly English footballers. But the guy he said he was enjoying a huge amount, this is some months ago now, was Mares. Yeah. And he'd spotted him in advance. He said, listen, he'll, he'll go to a big club soon. He's yeah. fantastic to watch. But you must see in the games that you cover little things that where you see maybe a player developing or emerging, somebody you like watching. What are the hidden corners of the quality that you see in the Premier League that you enjoy? I think Mares is the obvious example. I mean, he, these guys, Igalo at, at Watford is, is another. And I think it's always refreshing to, to see a guy who hasn't cost a lot of money yeah. all of a sudden come into a very, very demanding league and become a star. A bit like Maravchik when he arrived at Celtic. Yeah, course, yeah. The difference between Maravchik and Mares is that Mares is 24. Yes. Lubo, I think, was 33 when he arrived in Scotland. There was, there was no real value for Celtic. Mares will go for a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I still think, I mean, I think the European results would suggest you're right and that perhaps the, the top players, mm -hmm. technically, mm -hmm. there are fewer of them now. European results would dictate that, I think. Yes. But th th there are still games you go to and, and you can go there knowing that even if the game is not that good, you will enjoy watching one or two individual players. Most football fans, whether they're sitting down to listen to you on Sky or, or paying to go to game, that's what they want. We all know you can't guarantee your team's going to win, but you want to be able to pick out three or four, like, tries like I would try, can play. Oh, and he's on the rise. That's a young yeah. kid. If you can come away from any match with that experience, you're at least yeah. semi-satisfied, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've gone to games at Man City and it's been a poor game, but yeah. I've watched David Silva for 90 minutes and I would never tire of watching David Silva. No, I, um, I don't honestly believe he's fully appreciated in England. Yeah, that city he is, but his gifts. I mean, his his movement, his gifts, his bravery. Yeah, you know. But I'll take it here. I'll take it there. And Fabregas as well. I mean, he played a pass at Burnley at the beginning of last season. I don't know if you remember it, for Shirley to score at Turf Moor. It was Chelsea's opening game of the season, and he played a pass, first time pass, through pass for Shirley, and he must have had eyes in the back of his head. Mm -hmm. And there are times where you look at that, and it is genius. Mm -hmm. And you feel it applauding. You, know? you touched on a player that I know him um, reasonably well. And um, he's a thorn in my side because word reached me from Arsenal. In the first two weeks I lived in Barcelona in 2002, um, Arsenal was setting a Barcelona player. And a pal of mine and I, we racked our brains. Of course, we didn't go down three levels to find a 15-year-old. And yeah. Steve Rowley had, and Francesc Cagliau, their, their Spanish guy, had spotted him. So that bugged me right from the start. But... 
When you watch him play, it confuses me how often people badmouth him, how rarely people think he should be in a starting lineup, how quick people are to turn on him. I've never really understood why. And he was one of the players that wasn't giving Jose Mourinho everything that he had in his locker. And I'm not saying deliberately, but his form under the difficult months for Jose Mourinho wasn't as good. But I saw him play for Spain against England during that run. Yeah. He completely ran that game. Yeah. And if Spain are going to win the European Championships again, which I think they have a fighting chance of doing, yeah. he should be starting next to Sergio Busquets in a two-man midfield behind a three and a one. And yeah. his gifts are fantastic, aren't they? When he's on form. Ah, it's, it's fabulous. I mean, I think by his own high standards, he's been off it he a did. bit. One of, you know, now and again, you, you see him hit a pass that nobody else has seen, nobody else would see. Mm -hmm. Quick-footed too. I mean, I think his, his little touches... I mean, he, he played as a striker. Did he really? When Spain won the European right. Championship. Right. You know, that this false nine. Yeah, idea. false nine. Yeah, the yeah. could put him up there for Spain. And yeah. They won it and he scored. And, they, and that's quite a remarkable footballer. I think that's unusual to be able to yeah. do. I'm going to cheat now because you, you threw me a line in remarkable passes and says Fabregas. It was a dud pass compared to... If I can take it back to Wembley. Uh, 1981. <laughs> um, there's a bit of a, a melee around the Scotland box and there's a couple of hacks clear yeah. I don't know if maybe your boot was on one of the hacks clear and the ball comes to your feet in the centre of the Wembley but give me some context please for people who are either English and don't want to remember this or Scottish and didn't see it well when are we talking about and what's your background before that moment when the ball drops to your feet? Well, it's Scotland, England, home internationals. I had never seen Wembley, far less played at Wembley. And Jock Steen told me the night before the game I was playing, hardly slept that night, got to Wembley. And sometimes I think you can burn up too much energy and nerves. And that was a day where I felt tired from the, the first whistle. I was really struggling to get a second win. Normally you get a second win mm -hmm. in a game within 10 minutes. Really struggling. I spent the afternoon chasing Kenny Sansom, player. who was just motoring up and down, and I hadn't really taken part in the game mm. until that moment where I found myself midway inside the Scottish half on the right-hand side of the pitch. Joe Jordan came short for it, screaming for it, but I saw Steve Archibald making a long run, and that, that was, was my favourite pass, if you like, something with a little bit of bend into the channel in behind, I think it was Brian Robson. It was Brown, obviously. It, it was. But I give people who haven't seen this, the things that come to my mind is, number one, the state of the pitch. I think I'm right in saying the Horse of the Year show had been on Wembley not you, long you've before. You've done me like a kipper. I was about to say it looked like Horse Guard Parade. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. Because <laughs> it was a heavy pitch, yeah. Tufts of turf. As yeah. if there's been a family of moles trying to come up and see That's the right. game for free or something. Yeah. So you, you, it's not the ideal passing surface. No, it, it's not. Anyway... I've, I've had a really poor afternoon and I've got one chance to redeem myself and, and find the right pass. And Distance of pass, do you think, maybe? I'm saying 30 metres. Yeah, maybe Yeah, maybe 30 metres, yeah. It's a, it's a uh, big pass. To be fair, Joe Jordan, I think, it might have been Alvin Martin he took short. Pulls him. Pulled him short and, and Stevie read the pass. Yeah. It was a bit like Costa's run for Fabregas. It was beautiful, yes. yes if the yes. forward goes early, it makes it easier for the guy to see the pass. Before we talk about what happens next, what's the technique of that pass? I, I genuinely mean given that you've always distributed the ball well. What is the technique? I think you, you just... I mean, the expression is you wrap the inside of your foot around it and just leave as much leather on the ball. If, if you're going to spin the ball, you've got to leave a bit of leather on it. Suppose you hit it like a draw shot in golf. When you hit that draw shot, are you... Once you've realised Steve's made turn, are you looking at him? Are you looking at the ball? Where are your eyes as you, as you actually make contact? Oh, you, you see the run, obviously. I, I noticed that Stevie was on his bike and it's a case of just trying to trying to give him something to run on to, because Stevie was quick. And I, I know if I knock anything in behind, there's a chance he might go on to it. And if I may say so myself, the, the weight was, was right on the money. And, and Stevie was very clever, very That's, clever. Whoa, because he, whoa, 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 whoa. If there's any inference that that wasn't a penalty and Brian Robson didn't pull him he, down cruelly, then I reject well, it. Well, Stevie put himself in a position where Brian Robson couldn't make a clean tackle. <laughs> no, he gets yeah. across the front he of him. He comes into him, yeah. Brilliantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the referee, who was Robert Wurtz, I think, I think he was French, described by Laurie McMenemy after the game as a flash Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Not that England were bitter about the penalty award. <laughs> Yeah, pointed to the spot, and, and we had Robbo, we had John Robertson, who, who just didn't miss on the big occasion. No, he didn't, did he? he was didn't a miss. Hell of a footballer. Yeah. Given that that was your 
first Wembley experience. What about the periphery? What about the you know the goal moment when it goes in, the final whistle, the post match? Just give us the privilege, because good as we are, well, you're, you're, that hasn't happened to us yet. It might in the future, but you're, share. You're, you're aware that it's a huge box that's ticked on your CV oh, God, to play for Scotland at Wembley, first of all, and, and to play in a winning Scotland team at Wembley. To make a goal with a is, gorgeous pass. Is, uh, is obviously huge. And that was the year that Ted Croker, I think, tried to ban the Scotland fans from Wembley because there had been some trouble. 77, I think, the Scots took the goalposts up the road with them. And some of the pitch, I think. And some of the pitch. So the English FA, with some justification, tried to make sure tickets only went to the home fans. Were there any of us there? My God, we came out the tunnel that day and it was, it was a <laughs> sea of yellow with uh, line rampants. It was like a Scotland home game. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but it was. There must have been 50,000, 60,000 Scots there. Mm -hmm. It was uh, amazing. You should have, um, not that I bear a grudge at all, but you should have spent more of your playing career supplying Steve Archibald. Because I believe that just about the point that Billy McNeil signed him for Aberdeen, you, in a fit of madness turned my glorious club down yeah. and didn't move from Kilmarnock to Aberdeen. Am I right about that? No, I, I could have signed for Aberdeen as a 16-year-old. I was playing for Port Glasgow Rovers and nobody had paid any attention to me as a, as a player. And all of a sudden, I've hit a very rich vein of form and I ended up with quite a few scouts in the house, one of whom was Bobby Calder. Oh, what a man. The famous Aberdeen oh. scout. Willie Fernie was here, the Kilmarnock manager. My dad, God bless him, said to me, look, don't go full-time. I was very tempted to go to Aberdeen. I wanted to be a full-time footballer. I always had wanted to be mm -hmm. a professional. My dad said, go part-time with Kilmarnock. If you're good enough, you'll get your move. Mm -hmm. So I, w I went to Kilmarnock and eventually, of course, went to Celtic after that. Mm -hmm. Billy McNeil did say that when he was at Aberdeen, he tried to buy me. But at that time, there was no freedom of contract. So no. you, could, you couldn't move. There was no transfer windows. There was no freedom of contract. The club could keep your registration. So even when your contract had expired, you couldn't move unless the club. You, you, you know, touched on a that. subject that it just by fluke, um, I, I was sent to John Matt Bosman's house. I'd said to my boss, "There's a story here," and I was sent there, and I ended up '95 in, in his parents' house where he'd moved, he sold all his belongings to pursue his fight against this, and the phone went, and it was the judgment. I was in his house yeah. or his parents' house with him interviewing, and the day the judgment came through. Wow which felt then as if somebody was looking after me because journalistically that was a big experience and a big story. We're celebrating the anniversary of that. It's probably the first time I've talked to somebody who's mentioned that they were affected by that. The system was criminally wrong, even if Kamarit didn't treat you as, as he was treated in yeah. Belgium. The system was just outrageously unfair. It was, it was. I mean, I think, uh, but for the contractual situation and those those days. It would have been a really good advantage for me to have had a profile in England before I started working as a commentator yes, in England. Yes, of course. And don't get me wrong, I have no regrets at all. I mean, that had a decade at Celtic, which were, were wonderful. There, there was a time where I could have gone to Arsenal and where Celtic just weren't prepared to let me go. Mm -hmm. You know, in hindsight, I, I wish I had tried English football at some stage. Maybe not necessarily at the time they tried to get me, but certainly at some stage. Mm -hmm. At minimum, it would have given you something to think about because you were a player of enormous ability. I suppose if you're going down a historic club like Arsenal, you feel confident that you can do something. Whether you'd have chosen to leave Celtic or not, you didn't have that opportunity at all. No, I, I didn't. I mean, it was, we were playing Aberdeen in a, a League Cup tie, a game in which Steve Archibald scored a hat-trick against Celtic. And Terry Neal was at the game. And I had one of those nights where everything went right for me. And got, got a phone call, was tapped by Arsenal. And I remember John Clark, who must have got wind of it, coming up to me in the training ground at Celtic and said, oh, is a man from Northern Ireland been on to you? And I'm pleading all innocence. I said, I don't know what you're talking about, John. And he gave me that knowing look. And he said, look, he said, if we sold you now, the supporters would burn the stand down. He said, forget it, you're not going anywhere. How close was that to the time? Because did Terry not also sign Charlie? He did, yeah. Did he you? signed Charlie in, what, 83? Yes. That would, this would be 79. Oh, my word. This would be... September, October 79. At a point when they'd just played a few months before in the cup final, I presume, and they lost three to right. Manchester United. Well, they so beat Man U, didn't they, Alan Sunderland? They beat, they beat Man yeah. Sunderland scored, correct, thank yeah. you for, for Arsenal fans, I'm sorry. So they were a leading, leading club rather than just a historic yeah, the, club. Yeah, they were a big club. It's funny you're very good at this, David, which is the reason we invited you in the first place, because John Clark was going to come up. The media are terrible buggers. <laughs> They'll phone you up and tell you lies. Um, 
There's a publication, we have a lot of listeners outside Scotland, and nobody outside Scotland have ever heard of the Weekly News. But the Weekly News phone you up at Kilmarnock, I believe, yeah. which is one of the funniest stories I can imagine. T tell us what happened. That was the way that, that clubs tap players. Um, I was in my parents' home in Gourock. I had just come home from training at Kilmarnock, and the phone rang, and I picked the phone up. This is uh, Joe Bloggs from the Weekly News here. I said, oh, yeah, how you doing? I'm ah, just wondering uh, how you're going on at Kilmarnock, what you think of the, the game and coming up on Saturday, blah, blah, blah. And after a few minutes, uh, it's actually John Clark um, of Celtic here. And I'm not sure whether it's a wind-up or not. He said, it's John Clark of Celtic. He said, uh, we're aware of your background. We're aware that you're brought up in a Rangers household. You're a Rangers supporter. We just want to know if we come in for you, whether you would sign for Celtic. And, and I said, well, absolutely, I would sign for Celtic. I'd love the opportunity to play for Celtic. And was, was very, very excited after that phone call. It, it took some time after that for the move to come off. Celtic offered command of money. They wanted more. They just sold Jim Stewart, Gordon Smith, Ian McCulloch. They didn't need the money. They could demand top dollar, and eventually Celtic stumped up. It's fascinating to me because it t I never knew growing up that Kenny Douglas, he grew up in the shadow of Ibrox with Rangers posters on his wall, which yeah. he did. It took me a long time, having lived in Spain, to find out Iniesta, before he became a fanatic of Barcelona, was a... Big Madrid fan. Really? In this series of interviews, we had a lovely chat with Jamie Carragher, who <laughs> couldn't have been more diehard Everton and hated it. I still see him in the gantry at Goodison. And when Carragher's got a day off, he's up in the gantry at Goodison <laughs> beside us. Don't tell Rafa Benitez. <laughs> who still thinks that Jamie had Everton sympathies. And, and that whole process of saying, oh, I'll say fear, let's not call him the enemy. But I've always wondered if it's difficult at all. Nah, well, I, I, don't, one way. I, don't, I don't find it difficult at all. I did mean, you then, though? I mean, not now, obviously, because you no, succeeded, you did everything you wanted pe people to. People in the west of Scotland know your background. <laughs> it's they know your background true, inside out. There's yeah. no point in trying to hide it. Yeah. I mean, I, I've played with some Celtic players who, who even to this day wouldn't admit they supported Rangers as a kid. What's the point in trying to hide what you were as you were growing up. I don't get that. Because everybody around your neighbourhood People knows. know anyway. Aye. So... Look, one thing that did intrigue me that I told you before we started the tape that when I was with Harry Redknapp, I thought it was being self-indulgent, asked about John White because I wanted to know. And it turned out that people listened to it and a lovely story that I've not shared with the boys is that John White's sister and brother listened to that podcast on Christmas Day and were in tears listening to memories of their brother. Yeah. This means that you had the chance to watch Willie Henderson. Yeah. Can, can you... Share anything about having been a talented winger. Can you share anything? Because I didn't see him live. I'd like to understand because he's regarded as a great, but I kind of feel that compared to Jimmy Johnson, he's not talked about as much. I'd like to understand. He, a bit he was more. certainly a, a fabulous player. I mean, I, I would first see Willie Henderson playing for Rangers when my dad would take me to Ibrox. I'd be seven, eight, nine years old at that time. Mm. And he was the one I watched because I was a winger. The thing I always remember about Willie Henderson, when the ball was knocked to his feet, there was this huge expectant buzz would go round the ground. And he was a fabulous player. I think you could argue he was eclipsed by Jinky. Mm -hmm. um, On ability? Or because Celtic had a better team? Or? I think Jinky, for me, edges it. I think he edges it. What but did Willie do with the ball when he had it? He was just so direct. Oh, really? He, he was much more direct than Jinky. I mean, ah. Jinky would beat the fullback, then yeah. beat him again just for a laugh. Willie Henderson would get to the byline as, as quickly as he could. And the thing I remember about him was his, his bravery. He was a bit like Jinky himself. I mean, the, the stick these boys took was ridiculous. That's one thing, I, and there are, there are very few things you can praise FIFA for, but by taking some of the hatchet men out of the game, they've, they've done the game a great We see players playing for longer, elite players with yeah. skill, with better careers. I think that's why it's difficult to compare Messi with Maradona. If you look at the treatment that Maradona took, 82 mm -hmm. World Cup's a great example. Mm -hmm. The, 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 you know, Gentile and... Italy and Argentina yeah. kicked hell out of him. Yeah. And, and it, reacted. And, it, and Messi, to that extent, is very fortunate that he's playing in an age of protection that Maradona was, was never exposed to. No, I completely agree. I and mean, then we sat here in this chair with Charlie telling us that he reckons he was the first to invent shin pads on the back of his yeah. calf as well as on the front because of the boot and he took. What sort of treatment did you take? Pretty brutal at times, to be honest with you. But you, you get to know the fullbacks they're going to try and do you and the ones who are hard but fair. I mean, if I was playing against Morris Malpass, I would know that, I mean, he would clatter me if he got a chance, but he, he wouldn't try and do me. Mm -hmm. Dougie Rugby, 
Just, just they're, steady now, steady. They're from ball game. Uh, Doogie we, didn't we, have a bad bone in his body. He was occasionally you, clumsy. You knew that if Doogie got a chance, he would he would hurt you. He would do you. Uh, and you, you get to know you get. I mean, I, I I don't hold that against the big guy. And I, I see Doogie now and again, and we have a laugh about it. They were just uh, the rules of engagement in those days. And it was part of the mentality that Alec imbued Aberdeen with that in order to yeah. get parity with Rangers and Celtic. If you yeah. left one in now and again, then uh, even the battle a little bit. There was a difference in the character between Dundee United and Aberdeen. I don't think there was much between the two sides. In ability. But there was a nastiness about the Aberdeen side which helped them, dare I say. No. I helped them. And a lot of the great sides are nasty. Is that pushed out of our game too much in Britain now? I think refereeing and you know the nature of the game has changed. Uh, Do you think the nature of the fan has changed? I sometimes lose my temper, which I'm a very placid guy. Particularly on social media where I hear, I see guys who are maybe 18, 19, 20, 25, and I say, that tackle's a shock, it's a leg breaker. Yeah. And all that's happened is he's clipped a boot as he goes for the ball and there's a foul on it. And you're like, you've got no idea. Yeah. That could be somebody's career. And you're like, yeah. that's unbelievable. And that nastiness. Now, we, again, we sat in this series talking to Graeme Souness. He went further and he went, look, this is eternal. Yeah. Well, Why do you think that there was the Coliseum? We need to do each other in, in battle. Yeah. Now, I... I you know, I'm not all for football carrying spears and shields. But I think we've lost an edge that is vital to football. There was one yesterday, Damien Delaney uh, came through uh, Diego Costa on the halfway line. Mm. He got a booking for it, Damien Delaney, he was booked for it. It was Nowadays you think yellow card automatically. In my day, he'd have been allowed three or four of them yeah. before the referee would even have a word with him. Yeah. So I think the game is better for that and I'm fed up hearing dewey Tales of Ron Harris and Norman Hunter. No, you, but now you're talking about people who go out to do damage, yeah, which is different. Yeah, and they, these guys wouldn't last two minutes now because... Couldn't play. Couldn't play. Or couldn't play particularly well. They could kick people. In those days, kicking people had a value, but not now. I, wanna, I think it would be wrong of me to close without two or three. One would be that you'd have had four, five, six years more of, of a high-level career had it not been for ME, which mm. I think at the time, we once sat and chatted about this for an interview, which you were really gracious and kind to give me when I was a young reporter. But it, it must give you some pleasure, at least, that we're clearer about it now, that not just in football, but in society, people understand it, because you were kind of isolated and alone at that time without information about what was ailing you. Yeah, I mean, it was a bit of a mystery before it was um, diagnosed. That I, I think the one thing... The one element about it where I was fortunate is that nobody thought I was malingering. A professional footballer doesn't give up the best job in the world unless there is something wrong with him. At the peak of his career. There are people with ME who people suspect are swinging the lead because they don't have a plaster cast in their arm, they don't have a bandage on their head, and they don't get the benefit of the doubt. And, and one of the hardest parts for anyone suffering for ME is being believed and getting support. Mm -hmm. And if you know that people are doubting your illness I think it, it adds to the pressure of, of how you're going to recuperate and how you're perceived. I think there's still a, an element within the medical profession who are pretty cynical about it, who still don't believe it's an organic I'm illness. I'm really surprised about that. Well, so am I. They believe it's a psychological problem. I can say with complete certainty, having given up a, a career at 29, yeah. it is an organic illness. It's a very serious illness. The guy who dubbed it the yuppie flu has a lot to answer for. I think he trivialised it. Mm -hmm. It's still ruining lives. It's ruining young lives. And I hope I live long enough to see them find some kind of cure for it. Mm -hmm. Did it leave you with an extra drive to do well in what came later? Did it, in some small way, gifted you the need to, to keep working and do this job that gives you a lot of satisfaction? I, I don't want to be dewy-eyed about that at all because I'd rather you had I think six, it, seven years more. Ironically enough, I think Emmy helped me get into the media. I, I got into the media early. My plan was to, to go to Australia. Eventually, I had played in, in Sydney in 1985. Yeah. Tommy Doherty got me fixed up there. I'd been out for most of the season with a hamstring injury. Got to the end of the season, and I was just getting up to speed when the season finished. And I went to Davy Hay and I said, look, I want to go to Australia and play the Australian season. I had relatives out there in, in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And Davy said, well, I'll phone Tommy Dock because he managed Sydney Olympic. Tommy Dock, God bless him, got me fixed up in Sydney Olympic. Really good deal. Went out there, played, did them a, a, a really good turn. And the owner of the club, Jim Pettinellis, said, look, when you're finished in a few years' time, you come out here. Wind your career down. You can coach the club. You can manage the club. 
And that, at that time was my long-term plan to go mm. back out to Australia with my new wife and start a new life. ME changed all that, knocked it sideways. And through ME, I got the chance to go into the media because although physically I was very poor, I could still speak, mm -hmm. had a reasonable grasp of the language. And through that, Paul Cooney at Radio Clyde gave me the chance to go into broadcasting at, at Clyde and everything else kicked off from there. Well, the evidence of us having asked you to come and share your time with us generously today says that, in our view, that's been a massive success. And I want to close, if we've got five minutes to close, which I think we do, we're going to close on an up for both of us because writing books is just a pain in the butt. It's long <laughs> and it's slow. And you phone somebody up and they give you a wonderful story and it lifts you and you say, right, I'm going to finish this chapter and I might make it through to the next one. And I did that with you one day and it allows us to talk about one of your great games. And the phone call was about, I remembered that you must have played against the current Spain manager, Vincente Del Bosque. Yeah, I did, yeah. When Celtic were in the European Cup, they drew Real Madrid, they were epics. He's, I think he's probably, in my opinion, going to coach Spain to the title again this summer for three in a row. And he says he's going to retire. And I wouldn't mind marking the end of this just by going back and saying that you were champions of Scotland and you drew Real Madrid. And with a particular focus on Del Bosque and what Billy told you about him, what you thought of him, but also that first leg in Glasgow. Tell us your memories of that. Tell us some stories about that tie. I still remember where I was when I had the draw for the first time. That, that's how big it was. It was big. I was driving over the bridge at Glasgow Airport over the river cart, it's one of the cart, I don't know whether it's what colour of cart it is, but it's a river cart. And I can still hear Richard Park saying, we have the European Cup draw and Celtic will play Real Madrid. You know, I was part-time with Kilmarnock probably a year previously and the mm -hmm. thought of playing against Real Madrid was, was mind-blowing. And I think it was a 67,000 sellout. I think the Celtic safety certificate would only allow 67,000. Although I think there might have been a few more <laughs> somehow in the ground that night. And I remember they, they played an all-blue, which didn't go down with the Celtic crowd. And for the first 15 minutes of the game, I don't think we saw the ball. Peary, Laurie Cunningham in his pomp at that time. And I remember Del Bosque getting the ball at one stage in the game. And we were swarming all over them like wasps. I mean, you, they talk about the high press now. We knew how to high press. And Del Bosque got the ball in, in midfield and he, he walked with the ball. He, he found this little pocket of space and he literally walked five or six yards with the ball. And it was almost a message as if to say, you will not knock us out of stride. A message to his team as well. Mm -hmm. Look, we can just play at our tempo. Never forget that. If I remember correctly, Billy talked to you about the Madrid team and picked Del Bosque out and said, look, look fast. Yeah. yeah, he said he, he can't run. He, he said, <laughs> which, was, which was true. Which was true. He said, but he's Van Hannigan, Baxter oh. type, any range of passing. Sure, he almost chipped Peter Latchford in the second leg in the Bernabeu. Yeah. He almost chipped him from about 40 yards. Very early on in the game, if yeah. memory's right. Big Peter got back to get his hand just under the bar and get it over. Yeah. But, uh, you know, to, to beat Real Madrid that night, I mean, that, that's. Which you did, 2 0. Beat him 2 0. I think we only had a couple of chances all night and, and took them. And we, we go to the Bernabeu and I, I could never prove anything, but I, I think the referee must have had a, a villa in the Costa Blanca after that game. Listen, I'm an Aberdeen fan. I don't carry a green and white supporting card. And I watched it and, and there were strange decisions yeah. at, at a time when Madrid and big clubs like that could, could certainly influence people. We were almost at half-time in that game. We were 0-0. We were, nil -nil. We were mm -hmm. on the back foot, but we'd, they hadn't had a clean chance the whole game. And he gave a free kick for Peter Laxford overcarrying, which was very unusual. You know, there was that six step, step six, six steps. Step. He reckoned Peter Laxford had taken seven steps. I mean, an utter nonsense to give that. So they've got a free kick inside our box. We managed to get it clear. They got a corner. Cunningham had a beautiful corner over. Carlos Santillana Super took hard. Peter Laxford right out of the game and into the back of the net. And the referee gives it. And there's 120,000 at the ground and you can imagine how that changes the complexion of the game they've scored right on half time yeah. I'm not saying we were a better side than them they were a better side than us but if we go in 0-0 it's a different game and they still only squeeze through if I remember I mean it's 3-2 in the end but I think Bonito scored the third he did the, yeah, yeah. he's no longer with us no nope, died in a car crash sadly Laurie's Laurie away. Cunningham as well I, know, I mean well, if you think about it Johnny Doyle yeah no I, I, Laurie Cunningham Bonito Tom yeah. Tommy, who was, who was a yeah, great man and, and inspired a lot of affection in me. It's 
I don't know, we're, we're doing this very near to the start of 2016, so maybe that gives us an excuse to say that we do these kind of things, we talk about these kind of things for those who've gone, those who are listening to the big interview who didn't know any of this before. Yeah. And it's our dearest wish that some of those who listen to your excellence in Sky go, oh, she's not a player, eh? Like, no. <laughs> and we, we applied the same logic to Charlie too, and I think it's not nostalgia. I think it's just putting people in the right yeah, place. Yeah, I think we all forget that. I mean, uh, we, we forget. I can, I can walk up to Celtic Park now and, and nobody will recognise me. Or only the older guys, if you know what I mean. Like me. You'd have to be of a certain vintage to recognise me. I'm a me. bit shocked And we, we, we tend to forget that, our, you know, there's a generation growing up who don't really know us. That's it. As footballers, they, they only know us as pundits and commentators and whatnot. And we, we tend to forget that. I'd like to, part of the reason for this series is to just paint some of the blank spaces so that yeah. people, if they're curious, not everybody will be curious, but they'll maybe go back and look. And increasingly you can look on YouTube or you can read, and the internet's a great gift for that. And uh, we are where we are today because of footballers like you. And um, as I expected it to be a massive pleasure. Really well, my pleasure as well, Graham. Great to see you. Thank you very much indeed. the fantastic things about having you guys as our audience is that you allow us to go into areas that maybe are unexpected, some abandoned meanders, and you stick with us. Now, I'm aware that because of my age, because of my nationality, not all of you will have seen or enjoyed that wondrous pass of Davies at Wembley on the Horse of the Year Parade Wembley turf. But believe you me, it's going to be on my Twitter feed so that you can watch it. Um, also on GrahamHunter.tv where I urge you to sign up for the mailing list. It's completely free and all it means is that we'll keep you up to date with all the blogs, all the content. We'll allow you via the GrahamHunter.tv website to ask questions for our upcoming guests. Get on it now. We're here still talking to people like David Proven and upcoming Peter Beardsley, Gary McAllister. Because you backed us on Kickstart, thank you very much for all of that. And some of you backed us more strongly than others. And that means that the shout-outs this episode are for Roddy Graham, Simon Perry, and Ivan Hennehan. So Roddy, Simon, Ivan, if you were in Spain, thanks for being our socios, our main backers. Some of the guys who said, we'll show you how much we want the big interview to continue. Loved it. Thank you. David's been a great guest. There are more to come. Stay with us. You're, you're part of an audience that's now 1.7 million. That's the number that I've downloaded the big interview. In the background, you can hear that David Bowie's playing a bit of sound and vision. Bowie died recently, affected me greatly, and it's because of people like him who took risks and who were creative and who decided to be curious about things that everybody who's creative decided to do their own thing and take their own risks. This has been a good one. The original idea was from Backpage, Martin and Neil, Neil White, Martin, Greg. Thanks for the creativity, the original idea, the organization, the backing, and the time you spend on it. Alex AD, make sure that everything's in its place. She's our sort of Pep Guardiola in terms of positional play. She's the woman, he's the man. Beer jacket, you beauty. And above anything, thanks to our audience for sticking with us, allowing us to take risks telling us how much you enjoy it. If you do, leave a review on iTunes. Stay with us. This is fun, isn't it? Love you. That's